So imagine it's your first day at a new job, and you arrive at the building which frankly looks a bit ominous. There's a security guard outside, and that could be good or bad. Inside, you start chatting with, with people, and suddenly you hear people yelling outside, so you run out to see what the commotion is all about. Dynamite! They're yelling. Huh. Someone has left sticks of dynamite all around the perimeter of the building. That's probably not a good thing. You go back in the building a bit flustered, only to be interrupted again, this time by gunshots. Bullets burst through the window and blaze past your head. This is definitely not a good thing. You might be wondering, what kind of work is this? And it is just as you'd expect. This is the job of a seamstress. <laughs> That's right, my friends, you are here to teach sewing. Dun, dun, dun. But luckily, you don't have to step to the dynamite and the gunshots because the actual new employee is Donaldina Cameron, AKA Dolly. And she looks pretty tough, yeah? I mean, look at that hat. The year was 1895, and Dolly was 25 years old when she arrived at the Presbyterian Mission Home in San Francisco's Chinatown. <laughs> and she had lived a fairly sheltered life to that point, coming from a religious family. Her father was literally a shepherd. So this was like little Bo Peep wandering into the set of a rap video. So Dolly learns that her new gig is surrounded by black markets. Opium, gambling, sex, all the good stuff. <laughs> Except it's pretty dark. There's mobsters running prostitution rings with young girls who have been tricked, kidnapped, and coerced into a lifetime in the illicit sex trade. If and when these girls manage to escape to the mission home, Dolly's going to teach them to sew. A skill for their new life. When she's asked if she's willing to continue, now having more context about what this would entail, she says, heck no, I'm not gonna teach sewing. I'm gonna get out there and help these girls. But let's back up. I mean, where did this all begin? Chinatown did not become a city of sin by chance. It starts with racism, which had been rampant, yeah, since the gold rush, and the Chinese really got the brunt of it reaching peak injustice in 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act, which basically ended all human rights <laughs> for the Chinese. But in particular, it ends immigration for Chinese coming to the United States. And just to be safe, it also prohibits interracial marriage, making sure that the Chinese men who are already here have no incentive to stay. But criminals see these restrictions and they think, cha-ching, this is a business opportunity because there are thousands of Chinese men already in the United States and there's ample appetite for an underground sex market. So prostitution is big business and it's more trick than treat. Women are tricked into coming to the United States for marriage and a job but then sent to a brothel and unable to leave. Families are tricked into paying their daughter's passage to the United States and then she is en route to the US and told Actually, your parents didn't pay the full fare, so you're going to have to work it off. Some families, broke and desperate in China's post-opium war years, sold their daughters for their own survival. Now, when I say girls, I really mean girls. Many of these were children, less than 10 years old. And many didn't live for more than five years after they arrived in the United States because they contracted deadly venereal diseases. So it's about time someone fearless step in. God always saves the day, right? But God wasn't spending a lot of time in Chinatown. <laughs> ah, but the missionaries were ready to fix that. They were off traveling around the world looking for people to save when some of them realized, by Jove, we have a plenty of people here that need saving. And so in 1874, the Presbyterians founded the Mission House, a refuge for trafficked girls. And by the 1880s, the home was filled with up to 60 girls at a time. So when Dolly learns the scope of what's going on and sees how young these girls are, she has to do more than sewing. Dynamite? 
Bring it on. Little Bo Peep is ready for her cameo. So these girls, they weren't easy to save. They were kept in basements and underground tunnels, hidden away in closets, and the brothel owners were constantly changing their whereabouts to stay ahead of the police. In order to get to them, Donaldina often had to coordinate raids. She'd find her way in by pounding down the door, sneaking through the windows, assuming fake identities to pose as clients of the brothel. And frankly, this image doesn't look that action-packed. That's because it's not an actual rage, th raid. This is a promotional image used to illustrate the type of work they're doing so they can get more funding to keep this operation going. The actual raids happened at night, involved disguises, violence, and racing through Chinatown's alleyways and over rooftops with those girls in their arms. But Dolly wasn't the only dame on these daring chases. She often brought an assistant from the home. Like Tian Fu Wu, whose owner had burned her as a punishment when she failed to do as he pleased. So she had scars all over her body, visible reminders of the mental and physical anguish that she had suffered. She managed to escape to the home and eventually took a job as Dolly's aide and translator. Tien was the public face of the mission home to the Chinese community, so she also received plenty of threats against her life. But she was fearless, so she went on saving those girls. Now these raids were intense, but once the girls arrived at the home, that's when the real danger began. The brothel owners considered them their property, so they weren't ready to let them go so easily. Threats were par for the course. One day, Dolly returned home to find an image of herself attached to the front door with a knife through the heart. Violence was common. Bullets through windows, hatchets and doors. You'd think the legal system might protect these girls, but think again. There were no child protection laws. In fact, Dolly helped establish the ones that exist today. But before she managed that, corrupt police were happy to sell the girls out for a sweet commission. They'd knock on the door of the home, claiming one of the girls had stolen something, and that girl would be put on trial, convicted of this fake crime, and returned to the criminal. Or the criminals would just pay off the police to steal the girl before she even made it to trial. In these cases where the girls were put in jail, Dolly accompanied them, spending nights with them so they wouldn't be alone at the mercy of the conmen. Dolly also spent a lot of time in court, defending herself, as that's what was usually up for debate in these trials, where brothel owners attacked her personality, her demeanor, her capabilities, anything to distract from the fact that they were running a business out of exploiting young girls. These brothel owners hated Dolly. They called her Fawn Kwai, White Devil, and they told the girls rumors to try and dissuade them from leaving. Don't go to the White Devil, they said. She eats babies. She drinks the blood of children. These girls were nine and 10 years old. It's not surprising that that scared some of them enough that they didn't even try to leave. But some girls did venture, like Yamada Waka, who came from the United States from to the United States from Japan, thinking she'd have a job waiting here when she arrived. But instead, she was sold to a brothel where she was verbally and physically abused. But she, met, she fell in love while she was there. And she escaped by climbing down a rope made of blankets, just like the movies. Unfortunately, she then finds out that the scumbag she had fallen in love with was also tricking her. And he also tried to sell her to another brothel. Luckily, she manages to sneak away to the mission home where she has time to recover a bit. But frankly, this is a lot of trauma. So it's a good thing she's fearless because after suffering years of emotional and physical trauma, Yamada started writing, channeling her anguish into words. And she eventually returned to Japan be to become one of the leading feminists there, working as a journalist, author, and lecturer. Her ideas were so popular that she was invited to the White House to meet Eleanor Roosevelt. When Yamada and other girls left the home, Dolly kept in touch. These girls were her family. They respected her. They looked up to her. They called her Lomo, Old Mother. I'm not sure how Dolly felt about being dubbed old, 
But I imagine she felt comforted that they viewed her as a mother, because although Dolly had no children of her own, she worked at the mission home for 40 years, saving nearly 3,000 girls and helping countless others with the legal work that she did to establish child protection and anti-human trafficking laws. But she didn't do that alone either. She did that with the help and the bravery of her adopted daughters. Like Jiang Gua Ying, whose family sold her into an infamous prostitution ring. Her owners decided when, where, and with whom she would be forced into sexual acts. She risked her life to escape and was then called to testify against those owners. During the trial, the lawyers verbally attacked her, dismissing her as a mere prostitute instead of a survivor. On top of all that, she was with child at the time. But she was fearless. So she gave that testimony and helped win the case that set a precedent for human trafficking in the United States, saving hundreds of other girls who had been held by her captors. Donaldina Dolly Cameron offered a home to thousands of girls who risked their lives for freedom. There they joined a family of fearless girls who had persevered through deeply traumatic experiences to become activists, doctors, social workers, helping other girls who had been trapped in a similar misfortune. So I'd like to toast to the white devil, her many daughters, and their fearless battle against the city of Seine.